Hey there, it's the Board Game Bandit, and today I want to talk about an interesting topic in an otherwise boring field, and that is logging my board game plays. Specifically, I want to talk about what this activity has taught me about my friendships and the people I play games with. I made it a goal for 2018 to start logging my plays. I had never done it before, and I only started doing it because my friend Dara told me that I should, and that we should always do what she says. But it's useful to know what I'm actually playing, how often I'm playing, who am I playing with. This is information that will help. In the past, I had mostly relied on my above average memory in order to remember the answers to all these things, but it was good to actually do it in a formal setting. What I didn't expect was that I would discover three major trends over the course of this activity, and that's what I want to talk about today. Some quick context, I don't want to bore you with numbers, but numbers are important. I have backgrounds both in computer science, which includes data mining, and sociology slash criminology, which includes analyzing numbers. So it's always important to set the stage and let you know where I'm getting this from. In three months of the year, I've had 90 total game plays across 39 unique games. Unsurprisingly, my two most played games are Smash Up and Deception Murder in Hong Kong, which are both in my top 10 games of all time, Smash Up being my number one, and also the source of the Crank It Up channel that I'm a part of. But the first trend I wanted to talk about is what happened when I looked at the actual log to see how many games I played with particular people. What's interesting is that there were certain people that I felt I hadn't spent a lot of time with very often this year, and those are the people that I had played the least games with. There was a direct correlation between the number of games I played with people and how closely I felt connected to them in the past few months. This is particularly difficult because my gaming group is extensive and I have gaming groups in several circles. In the largest one, it's as many as 16 people at a time, all in one place, and it's impossible to spend equal time with everybody. But it's something that you should aspire to because your gaming group can be your friends. They could be your adopted family. These people matter. And what was interesting was how top-sided it seemed that in a large gaming group, I seem to be playing with the same people more than others. That's something I definitely am going to have to pay attention to and will try to take corrective action. Many people often complain to me that gaming isn't social. They only see me playing the game at the table. But what they don't realize is that they don't see the people around me that I'm playing with and that I socialize through gaming. The simple act of being around one another at the table, that's how you get to know people. They may not see it because they're only focusing on the actual mechanics that we're playing, but it does happen. And sure enough, it makes total sense that the numbers would align with people that I haven't been spending as much time with. The second trend is something that's much harder to quantify. And basically, it's a ratio between how many games am I suggesting for myself versus how many games am I letting other people choose. One of the great things about gaming is that not everybody needs to have their own collection. It's certainly plausible that a few people can supply all the games needed for a group as large as 16. It's one of the things I really like about gaming. It can be costly, but that cost doesn't have to extend to everybody, and I'm happy to be one of the ones who can accommodate it. But with that comes another set of challenges. I have a large collection, probably one of the largest in my gaming groups of over 200. I know that may seem small to some people, but I only have so much space and only so much time, as you can tell by my lack of plays at 90. So how considerate am I being when I'm playing with other people? If I'm constantly playing only my own games and the things that I bring with me, that means I'm not listening or I'm not giving opportunities to other people. People don't want to be playing a new game every single time. When I bring a game to a game night, it's usually in the form of a bag and it's several games in that bag. One of the things that drives me nuts is when I make an entire bag, pack it carefully, take everything out of its proper place, only for it to not be used at all. And I imagine that many of my friends feel the same way. It's actually really difficult to transport games and you worry about the boxes being damaged. So if you are going to transport them, you want to make sure that you get some use out of it. So how am I doing in terms of this? I'm not really sure what the percentage should be, but the percentage is 25%. 10 of the 39 games I played this year 
are ones that were owned by my friends and that they suggested. That number may seem a little bit low, but again, I don't know what the number is going to be. But the part that is definitely low is that for each of these games, I've only been playing them once. I think it's great to have a mechanism by which you can measure yourself to see how well you are sharing the spotlight with other people. I very often get frustrated when there are games that I can't get to the table, and I can only imagine that many people have the same frustrations. I don't want to be the one who is exacerbating that by being the only person allowed to pick what game we play. That's not what it means to have a gaming group. This is something I hadn't even considered when I started locking plays, and until I looked at the numbers, I didn't even cross my mind that this is something I could be failing at. So I'm glad that locking plays brought it to my attention, and it's definitely something I'm going to have to look at in the future. The final one is a very interesting phenomenon, and I'm curious to see if anyone else has had a similar experience. The phenomenon is that you can tell a lot based on the people that I'm adding to the players in the board game app. When I look at my phone contacts list, this is something I don't want to be particularly long. It's harder to scroll through, it makes it harder to find what you're looking for, it just seems like it's so bloated sometimes, and you wish that you can kind of hoon it down if you hadn't talked to someone in five years. You know, what are the odds that they still have the same number? These are thoughts that often cross my mind, and I'm guilty of pruning the occasional person or two. What I found with locking plays was that there was a decision I had to make as to whether or not you would be logged as a player versus an anonymous player. If I didn't log you, it basically meant that I had made up my mind about you and that I did not see myself playing with you in the future. I don't want my list to get particularly long, it's very cumbersome to actually use the app, but if I did include you, it felt like you had made enough of an impression about me and I see you as being part of my gaming future. I don't like the statement that it makes about the people who aren't, and this is something that I need to fix. Sure, it's my own neurosis that makes me want to make sure the list is not that large, but why am I doing this? The point is, is that I'm trying to keep track of the memories that I've made with specific people. If I meet someone, and I am preserving that anonymity by not actually logging them, I think that defeats the purpose of the social aspect of gaming that I'm so heavily trying to promote. If people are complaining that gaming isn't very social, how does me keeping you out of the official record book change that? It may not seem like a big deal to people, but it is. Imagine that you're on the other side of the table. How would you like to know that you're being treated differently from everybody else? That you're the anonymous person that you didn't make an impact on someone. I would never want someone to feel that way. I know how hard it is to be a new person at the table. I think there are occasions where this is acceptable. Deception, for example, I routinely play with 12 to 13 players. Very often, I'm playing the forensic scientist, I'm teaching to a large group, and people are added in at the last minute. These are truly anonymous people. Sometimes I don't even get to know their name, and they leave as soon as the game is over, even though they've enjoyed the experience. I can't help matters like that. But if you're the one person who's new at the table, if I'm taking the time to teach you a game, then I need to be doing a better job at solidifying that experience and making sure that I capture it appropriately. There's also the problem of the fact that a decision has to be made based on someone's first impressions. This is never going to be accurate. There are some people that I know right off the bat that these people are great gamers and I want them to be part of the group. I've had many success stories that way. I've also had a lot of surprises on both sides of the table. People that I thought were great that ultimately just didn't get along and we had personality clashes. Or people who were new to the idea but warmed up to it over time and became some of the best players that I know. If you don't start including them in the lock from the beginning, then what happens if you decide that you actually do want to later on? You've lost all that history together and that would be disappointing to me. As I said, this is something I need to work on and I'm not sure what the solution is, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. The simple thing is to just simply take the time and log everybody. And while that doesn't seem sustainable, maybe that's actually for the best. Because it makes you err on the side of caution and believing in people. If we're going to be board game ambassadors, then we need to believe the best in people. And we need to go the extra mile to make sure that they have the best experience possible. Whether or not I log their name in the book isn't going to change that experience but it definitely makes a statement about how I'm going to proceed with them in the future, and that is what is going to define their experience. I wouldn't have expected that such a menial task would have such important implications, but that was something I definitely noticed about logging plays. 
Three months is a short sample size, but still the trends were significant enough to emerge and it alerted me to things that I need to correct. If you haven't logged your plays before and these are things that matter to you, you may want to consider doing it just as a metric to see how well you're doing in your gaming group. I've always said that gaming helps foster friendships and relationships, but logging plays has taught me that it could also give evidence as to where you need to do better. If I didn't have enough reasons to log my plays before, I definitely do now. On the Board Game Bandit, and our game has just begun.